Hello, and welcome to another episode of Just Played, where I talk about tabletop RPGs I've recently participated in as either a player or facilitator. I'm your host, Jim Crocker, and I've just played Under Hollow Hills by McGay and Vincent Baker. It is a PBTA game of the lives of a traveling fey circus. This particular scenario was a two-session mini-arc called The Midsummer Court, based pretty closely on William Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. This particular game was privately organized among friends. We played it online using Google Docs, in this case, Google Slides, and StreamYard. I've had this one in the can for a little while, so we played March 1st, 2022, just uh, beginning of the month. I was a player in this game. I was invited to participate by our game master, John Birch. So in Under Hollow Hills, all of the characters are either mortal or fey. So for my player character, I played Linden Wisp, The Winding Rose, which is one of the playbooks. That's a fey playbook. My friend Blair played Abner Lang, the Lostling, a mortal character who was abducted by Fae and lived their life in uh, the fairy realms. And his sister Andrea, with whom I've also played a bunch at conventions and uh, some of our house cons that we have amongst friends, was opalescent dusky spume, known to the company as Opal. And she's the nightmare horse. So she was an actual horse that took the form of a horse, a talking horse, of course. And her job is to bring dreams and nightmares to mortals. So... For our starting situation, the company, our company of performers, our circus, had played a couple of sessions previously. So I was coming in just after they had completed entertaining a mortal coming of age ritual in modern era New York City. So at this point, the company has been invited to perform for the Midsummer Court in the Kingdom of Fairy. Now, this is a prestigious gig, so we need to make sure everything goes perfectly. And the game opened with our arrival at court at the Midsummer Court. So the game opens with our caravan pulling up in Theseus-ruled Athens. It's sort of classical Athens, sort of, because where we are is also overlapping with the kingdom of fairies. So there's kind of, we're like on the outskirts of Athens, but it's also the fey realm. It's kind of one of these interstitial spaces that are in a lot of fairy tales and folk tales and things like that. So we want a big entrance. So we burst into the place doing a big arena rock musical number. That's my thing, grabbing everyone's attention so that my companions can go mingle and gather information about the audience in preparation for the big show, the main event, our, our circus performance. So Robin Goodfellow approaches us, all smiles and glad handing, but it's clear that King Oberon and Queen Titania are on the outs because Queen Titania isn't there to greet us at all. She's off in her chambers, and everyone is exceedingly coy about what exactly is going on. It's this court intrigue thing where they're not telling us what's happening, but we're expected to understand that there's something wrong. So Opal goes off in search of Queen Titania, sparring with her retainers, but ultimately not managing to secure an audience with her, though she does in fact confirm that Titania is kind of on a tear right now. Things are definitely tense, and we really need to watch our step or we're going to be in deep, deep trouble with the court. As is his want, Abner heads into the crowd to hype up the show and see what the common folk are saying. Robin and Oberon's other retainers are scandalized by the presence of this mortal barging into their midst, so he doesn't make much headway, but Robin does present him with a list of things we shouldn't include in our show. And it's all the stuff you'd expect given the cast. Mortals, donkeys, mortals crossed with donkeys, love potions, that sort of thing, all verboten. So while this is occurring, I am singing and am seeing, holding the crowd's attention, and I bring Oberon up on stage so that we can do our favorite karaoke song. And this is where we establish that I helped organize his bachelor party before he and Titania were wed. So I've definitely got some pull with him, but maybe not so much with her. So we get back together and we all compare notes and we decide to try and lure Titania out. It does not go well. I sing her favorite karaoke song, which she believes is meant to mock her and get a laugh out of Oberon. So she sends these chill winds to blow across our stage and they push my aspect, part of my character, which had been full summer, all bright colors and bare feet and stuff like that, towards winter. And my pal King Oberon laughs, convinced that I am now solidly on his side in their spat, which we really did not want to be in the middle of. That, yeah, that was obviously a hard miss on that attempt to try and bring her in. So uh, we kind of ended there with the fake court abuzz with gossip. Our stage is almost set, and we'll be going on next session to present our entertainment. 
My favorite moment from another PC, I was delighted by Andrea's role play of a magical talking horse who nonetheless had a job to do. She somehow managed to get across the idea that this creature tasked with delivering terrible nightmares to mortals was just a working stiff doing their job and just trying to get by and enjoy themselves despite a day job that they didn't pick for themselves, but which was kind of given to them. The dice didn't go her way this evening mostly, but that just served to further underline the hard knock life of an immortal nightmare monster who just really wants to get through the day. It was a vibe reminiscent of something like what we do in the shadows. I really liked it. It was a much needed contrast to my own character's kind of flamboyant extraness and I was definitely there for it. My favorite moment from the GM in this particular game, John made us a slide deck for the game info and all of the NPCs and other characters. So my favorite thing he did was to provide a list of very evocative names of who was in the company and then let us drop them in whenever we needed someone to fill a role. I'm not sure whether that's a thing that's actually built into the prep for Under Hollow Hills, but if it is, he did it really well in a way that was useful to us. And if not, it was just a great idea. So when I realized that, of course, I was a glam rock star, that was my character, we had several possible circus-flavored names for both individuals and groups ready to go, resulting in Linden Wisp and the Dandy Seed Players as our headliners, because the Dandy Seed Players were one of the options on that list. Names are a pretty significant issue for me in all games. I try to keep an online name generator open at all times, but this targeted list of genre-appropriate names ready to go really helped us get in step with the Shakespearean vibe he was going for and was very helpful to me as a player, so I really appreciated it. Something I noticed about the game is that one of the issues I often have with games about fey characters, this is a thing I encounter in like Changeling the Lost and other similar games, is the difficulty that they have in establishing the tone, specifically as far as striking a balance between the deadly serious and casually whimsical aspects of fairy-associated folklore and fairy tales and things like that. Under Hollow Hills does a couple of really interesting things to acknowledge and explicitly mechanize that tension. First, it manages to make the fey and mortal characters genuinely asymmetric, but without being unbalanced. It's kind of hard to explain it succinctly without actually having seen it in play, but the fey are these immensely powerful beings, but they're strictly bound by internal rules and this is important. They're always vulnerable to cold iron, which all of the mortals have access to. So it's like playing a game where half the characters are Superman, but everybody else in play can easily get their hands on kryptonite, right? So the way the game handles those restraints on fairy behavior works because the bakers have very clearly and cleverly built them into the MC's reactions as moves and put them right into the playbook. Every fairy PC has a short list of how obligations and slights and formal violence are understood in fae society. Deviation from those norms isn't against the rules of the game in any sense. Like the game doesn't say these are the rules you have to follow, but it's crystal clear that it's against the rules of the setting to break those based on how that's all laid out. And the consequences for breaking them are clearly spelled out. It created this really dynamic tension between these powerful beings constrained by culture and tradition and the mortals who were puny in comparison, but free to improvise and importantly screw up in a way that gave them a suite of options not available to my character. I really enjoyed it, despite my general aversion to these sorts of courtly intrigue things, and I'm definitely looking forward to playing more to see how it holds up under the pressure of our big command performance that we have coming up and whatever Shakespearean-level blowback any of our missed roles generate. So that's it for this week. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Likes Games, which is also the name of my YouTube channel where I've compiled hundreds of hours of actual play tabletop RPG videos. You can purchase game stuff I've written at my itch.io page and on drive-thru RPG under Jim Likes Games. 
and look for me at conventions, working with my friends at Indie Press Revolution. I'm pretty sure the next show I'm going to be at this year is probably Origins in Columbus, Ohio. Finally, listen for me on other shows in the Curmudgeons and Dragons family of gaming podcasts. If you like what I'm doing here, please rate and review the show and tell your other gamer friends about it. This episode was written and voiced by me, Jim Crocker, and produced by Jason Portizo. That's it for this week, so if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go play another game. Thank you for listening to Curmudgeons and Dragons. Please share this with your favorite adventurers. Leave a review on Apple and follow us on social media. All links can be found at curmudgeonsanddragons.com. Practice safe adventuring, my friends. This has been a JTP Audio Podcast. Thanks for listening.